Don, thank you so much for coming on to my YouTube channel. And I'm really glad that we can have this conversation today about motivational interviewing. So do you want to, for those who don't know you, um, probably might be just one or two, or maybe a little bit less because you have done such a great job in motivational interviewing that I guess a lot of people might be aware of your work and the presence in the industry. So tell me a little bit of, of your background, why you decided to be a dietitian and why the focus on motivational interviewing within dietetics? Right. Well, thank you, Astrid, for having me on your show, first of all. Uh, what a pleasure to get to do this with you today. And my love for nutrition stemmed from my career in athletics. So I was a, a swimmer, grew up uh, doing that and swam in college and just noticed, you know, in high school already just how performance was affected by the foods that I ate and just became really intrigued by that. And so I knew going into college, that's what I wanted to study. Um, I had the dream of being a sports dietitian, but uh, that changed once I learned about all the different facets of nutrition and dietetics and um, started off my career after college working in a outpatient clinic with uh, veterans and uh, really enjoyed that work and, and was just very intrigued from the very beginning of my career about motivation and about what um, makes people tick and how you know I could have uh, an effective appointment with a client. And I didn't know motivational interviewing. It wasn't something you know that was really around or, or necessarily taught in my undergraduate career. So I learned kind of what worked and didn't work through a lot of trial and error, unfortunately, um, to my, you know, for my clients. Um, but it wasn't until I uh, then went back to school and got graduate degrees and uh, headed into academia that I learned about motivational interviewing and, and thought, where has this been? You know, where has this been all my life? This actually makes so much sense. And I want the do over button <laughs> to be able to go back and uh, with those same clients and use some of these techniques and strategies and then immediately started teaching my students uh, this technique and skills. I've been running health coaching programs at the two different universities where I've worked and have really enjoyed watching um, how when I can train students in this technique and then watch them just flourish with it and uh, sort of live vicariously through them in their interactions with their clients and provide supervision in that way as well. So it's been a wild ride, but um, it's been absolutely rewarding. And I really uh, am so thankful about this technique that Miller and Rolnick developed that has just revolutionized how we can interact and engage with our clients. And it's just such a supportive way of being with someone that it's also impacted my relationships outside of work um, in terms of just being a more caring, compassionate communicator in general, which I often hear from my students happens as well. Yeah, that's very true. I, I can tell from, from like a little bit of my, my background, I generally have been a dietitian for a while now, perhaps let's say since I graduated from college about eight to nine years already. Uh, but I never knew about motivational interviewing until I did my master's degree here in Australia. And the, that's where I sort of understood a little bit more the behind the scenes when you are more communicative and try to engage more with your patient rather than telling them what to do. And I found that so amazing and making you be more a practitioner who listens and who wants to understand and help your client rather than just um, oh, you know, this is a meal plan. This is what you need to follow. See you in two weeks. And there was no interaction whatsoever or no uh, crossing of information, no understanding what the background of the patient is coming from, what's happening with them. So there's no change. And you see them in the two weeks later and there's nothing has happened. And they probably didn't, they didn't, they didn't even follow the meal plan at all. So I definitely feel like not just in dietetics, but also with relationships, motivational interviewing, or some of the skills can really be helpful. Now, you've been a dietitian for a few years now, 
Oh my goodness. Over 20. <laughs> oh my God. That's amazing. And what, if you, if you could decide this, this, this define motivational interviewing, why is this such a powerful approach when it comes to behavior change in your opinion? Yeah, it's really because it's a collaborative experience instead of a top down approach of, you know, here's what you should do and here's why you should do it. Um, it comes about behavior change and the whole topic sort of from through the back door. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it still has a behavior change goal element to the conversation, um, but it's really about evoking or inviting the client's personal reasons for change into the conversation and um, helping the client basically see that they often have really great reasons for why they want to make a change. We sort of shine a light on those reasons by using reflective listening. We use affirmations to help them see that they have what it takes to be successful in this change. And um, in the, the very core of motivational interviewing is just this aura or this vibe that you're giving off of just total acceptance and non-judgment. And you're just coming alongside your clients um, and, and saying, yeah, change is hard. And here I am. I want to just support you in whatever ways would be helpful. But you know what you need. You know, you know what's best for you. Um, you have important reasons for why you want to change. And I'm just here to provide a space for you to talk that out. I think that's so important just because when you come to see a practitioner, you feel like a little bit scared or ashamed for whatever reason you have been going through certain uh, problems with your health or with your nutrition, your choices, and feeling like someone is going to listen to you and actually tell you, I've been there as well. Uh, sometimes they feel like we are not humans, like we are superhumans and we, we are uh, in another in not in another world so they sort of need to reach to us and cross that barrier B being able to see that there's no barrier and we are equal that's amazing that's very powerful well when you talk about motivational interviewing session within the, the session um you commonly include seg segments like um engaging focusing um evoking and planning Take me through this process. Yeah, these are known as the four processes of motivational interviewing. And I got really excited when I learned about these four processes because they really serve as a roadmap within a session. And especially with my students when I'm teaching them motivational interviewing, um, often students like to kind of learn things in a stepwise fashion. And this provides sort of a stepwise fashion to an MI session. And so the first process being the engaging process means that we always wanna start off um, really just taking a moment, taking several moments to get to know our clients, find out what, um, you know, what they're into, what they like to do in a typical day, what they, what they value, find out about their health goals. There might be a reason maybe they, re they were referred to you, but that might not actually be what they personally want to get out of the session. So really just taking the time to show like, here I am, I wanna partner up with you in this journey. Um, I just wanna to get to know you, hear more about you, um, find out what you care about and, and, and tell me about your life, you know? So you're asking those types of questions in the engaging process. From there, um, typically the topic of a session kind of comes up. So what were you hoping to get out of this session or what was the, you know, topic that you were hoping we could talk about today. And then you slowly start to sort of funnel the session into a single behavior change topic. And sometimes if a client is referred for something like high blood pressure, you might say, okay, so, you know, the, your blood pressure is a concern of yours. There are a lot of changes a person can make to improve blood pressure. Um, you know, maybe you already know what those are. If you don't, I can tell you what those are. Uh, but from those different changes, you know, adding more fruits and vegetables, being more physically active, talking about stress management, those sorts of things. Which, which of those changes interest you as a direction that we could talk about today? 
oh, sodium, right? Also sodium. Um, so anyways, that's the focusing process is just kind of laying out all the potential directions on the table and then inviting the client to, to choose the path. You know, what is the first step? What is the behavior change that makes the most sense to kind of start talking about first? From there, and that's the focusing process, from there, um, the conversation can move very naturally into the evoking process where the client picks the change. Let's say uh, for blood pressure, the client decides, oh, I want to talk about ways I can be more physically active. From there, um, you start asking why, why, you know, tell me more about why you picked that one um, over the other ones. And what are some other benefits that you're hoping you'll experience when you start to be more physically active or be more consistent with physical activity? And in, in what other ways will this affect your life? Let's say you were physically active consistently for six months. How do you think life would be different six months from now? So asking those questions that really gets them to speak their personal reasons for change. And once we, we hear that they have a lot of great reasons and they're like kind of getting excited about the change, then we can help them make a plan. So, you know, what do you like to do for physical activity and um, how would that work into other areas of your life and what days of the week might work and what times of the day and how long do you think you'll go and how will you find ways to enjoy this experience? Um, and so inviting the client to kind of set a small goal to get started. And that's known as the planning process. Okay. So again, engaging, getting to know the client, focusing, inviting them to pick a behavior change they want to talk about today, evoking means asking for their personal reasons for why they want to make that change, eliciting those reasons from them, helping them hear that they have great reasons for making a change, and then planning, inviting them to set a specific goal to get started if they're, if they're ready. Not every client is ready for the planning part yeah. of the session, but if they're ready. That's amazing. Let me ask you something, just as a little bubble that I wanted to ask you in your experience with like working with clients do have you ever have have this ever happened to you that you're working with a client uh in the first session or even or with a couple of sessions that you are um doing some counseling or working with them and they have such a powerful responses and all their the reasons are laid out. They know what to do, but obviously they didn't know how to find the answers. That you, even as a dietitian, you end up not even, even giving any meal plan or anything at all. Perhaps it's more about motivation or doing actions or just getting someone to be accountable for mm -hmm. and nothing to do with nutrition specifically or food. Yeah, yeah, it's it really varies, um, but it's always best to start with uh, a question like, "What do you already know <laughs> about high blood pressure?" or "What do you already know about changes people typically make to help with this situation?" Um, because I certainly don't want to be giving them information they already have, right? Because that's a waste of both of our time. Um, and so it is really important to start with what they already know. Sometimes, a lot of times, I think you're exactly right. The client actually knows, like what they quote should be eating, right? They just, for a lot of reasons, aren't doing those things. Um, but there are certainly other appointments where there's misinformation, like they think they know what's best, but it's you know maybe not um, evidence-based. Or they really have a brand new diagnosis of something that they're just really unfamiliar with. And then um, there may be a little bit more sort of information giving in those types okay. of sessions. Okay. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. Um, now, MI was developed in response to like a widespread ambivalence to change, right? Client motivation and readiness to change seems to vary very much depending on the situation and what's happening with these clients for changing. Now, how can you define this term amb ambivalence? What is that? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's important to look sort of at the root of MI, where it came from. And again, it was developed by Miller and Rolnick, who were in the drug and alcohol counseling realm, where there is so much ambivalence, right? Because those substances are doing something for the participant that is appealing. And they don't, you know, there's part of them that doesn't want to um, have that addiction. And there's part of them that wants to 
um, you know, hold on to it because it's doing something. And so that really is the definition of ambivalence is having mixed feelings about a change. And um, I want everyone to hear that that is the human experience. We all have ambivalence every day about so many different things. And so um, I think just kind of validating and normalizing ambivalence for our clients is such a better approach than judging it, right? Yeah. Um, and so just kind of saying, yeah, it's, it's hard. Like you've got some reasons you haven't made this change yet, right? And then you've got um, some things you're really hoping to experience as you make this, these changes. Um, and so kind of helping to shine a light on that ambivalence in a non, non-judgmental way that just holds a lot of compassion and giving them the space to kind of talk it through and decide what is, you know, what's best for them um, moving forward and, and for their long-term outcomes and how do, how does it kind of relate back to what their original goals or health, um, values about their overall life values, you know, that they maybe expressed at the beginning of the session. And so when we talk about ambivalence, we talk about, um, change talk and sustain talk. And so that's really how, um, clients often talk about change is they, they, have a lot of great reasons they want to make the change. And so we label that um, in our heads, not out loud, but the practitioner labels those things as change talk. Um, so a client might say, yeah, you know, I really want to make this change because my, my wife is on me, <laughs> you know? And so that's like change talk because even though it's maybe not intrinsic, it's like one of the reasons that person maybe wants to make a change is to get his wife off his, off his back. Right. Um, or I really, um, don't want to have a heart attack like my uncle did. Um, so that's like another form of change talk or gosh, it would be so great to have more energy during the day. You know, that's change talk. So all of those are things that the client says in favor of change. So the MI practitioner is listening for those little nuggets of change talk because we want to reflect those nuggets back so that the client hears said back to them, you know, that they have these really great reasons. Sustained talk is anything the client says um, in favor of staying the same or in favor of not changing. So they say things like, um, you know, I would make that change, but, you know, it's really cold outside or um, it's just a lot easier to eat out, you know. And so um, anything that the client says in favor of kind of not changing or why they haven't made this change in the past or um, some of the barriers that have come up in the past. Those are sustained talk. And so clients are gonna speak both change talk and sustained talk. And they often speak change talk and sustained talk in the same sentence. And so um, just giving them that space to kind of talk it out, but at the same time, helping them hear the change talk, we kind of want to soften the sustained talk. Like, yeah, I hear you. These are some of the reasons you haven't made this change. And I'm also hearing that if you were to make this change, you know, here are all the ways that that would really benefit you that you you're a kind of already aware of and so um shining a light on that change talk is what makes motivational interviewing so powerful just the act of hearing it spoken back to you all those personal reasons for wanting to change actually increases motivation and it's really hard to believe <laughs> that that works and my client my students are always shocked they're like hey you told us that works but i actually saw that work you know when i started talking you know to my aunt the other day so um, it's amazing how simple it is and yet how challenging it is to master. In your experience, when you talk about external motivators or like it's not a intrinsic wanting to change, uh, do you think or do you feel like it might be less powerful or do you try to find some really internal motivations that can make the person be more focused on that? Because Sometimes external motivators are not as powerful. Like, yeah, my wife is behind my back, but that's not enough for me to actually make a change. So what, what, it, what would you be thinking or doing in that case? Right. And in that example, it may actually make the person want to rebel against their spouse. Correct. Right? So a reverse effect. So yeah, um, we can rely on researchers, DC and Ryan, who developed the self-determination theory. And the self-determination theory um, is so interesting if you ever want to read up on, on theory, which that doesn't sound like a lot of fun to anyone, but this theory is really 
fascinating because it gets at exactly what you're talking about, those intrinsic versus those extrinsic forms of motivation. And what they found is that intrinsic forms of motivation are associated with long-term change. And so I think it is super important to ask questions of your client that really gets at those intrinsic motivators. Um, so when a client, for example, says, like, so maybe I ask, um, you know, tell me about a time you tried this change or a similar change in the past and how, how did it make you feel? And the client might say, oh, I felt great, okay? Um, you don't wanna stop there, right? Great, you felt great. Tell me what that, like, tell me more about that, right? Um, what, what does great feel like? <laughs> Um, and we're really just trying to get them to, to, to those words like, well, I had more energy or I was in a better mood. You know, great can feel so like be a lot of different things to different people. So getting them to really speak those intrinsic motivators and hear, again, hear themselves say um, those intrinsic motivators, I think is really powerful. So yes, studies show they are more powerful than the extrinsic motivators. You can also look at the literature on like, now I'm really nerding out, sorry, but the literature on like extrinsic forms, like extrinsic reward systems. So a lot of like health insurance companies will use extrinsic rewards. Like if you do so many steps or you lose so many pounds and you get so many points and all of that. And they found that it only works for in the short term. It doesn't work to support sustained changes in the long run. So extrinsic rewards might get someone started on a change, like a client could certainly set a goal, like once I'm active for a month, I'm gonna buy myself a new pair of tennis shoes, you know? And um, there's not a lot of harm in that, but unless they're sort of starting to tune in to the intrinsic motivation, like how they feel during the walk, how they feel after the walk, um, you know, that, that it's not gonna be sustained change until those intrinsic rewards are really internalized. and. Yeah. MI coaches can really help a client like notice and internalize those intrinsic forms of motivation. This is very powerful because I see this all the time in coaching uh, and working with clients when you get someone who is like way, way driven. Like if the way goes up or goes down, it's like that's the reward for them. If it goes down, they did well, but they, they are not paying attention to all different things that they are actually achieving. Uh, when they change any particular behavior or they have a small win. So when you focus on other things like a small win or like a mindset change that you were you were restricting a lot before and now you're no longer restricting as much and you're giving yourself unconditional permission to have certain things, that change that small changes are progress. But and that was probably something that were that was hindering the progress before, but they they just think oh, it's just because I don't, I'm not doing the right diet. And it's not about the diet, it's that you're not consistent with it or you're not able to adhere to it properly because it doesn't fit your lifestyle, your preferences, or it's actually affecting you to a point that you're not able to progress with it. So going into the next question, um, I love that you talk about this, uh, the stages of change because I think that's the most powerful thing when we understand that someone, whether is ready to change or is this person feeling like they have no even, they are not even aware that, that there is a problem or they actually wanting to do something, but they don't know how, or they don't have the, you know, enough self-efficacy to do it. So tell me a little bit about the stages of change. Yeah, so the stages of change um, are sort of known as like a distant cousin from motivational interviewing. So, um, there is, you know, some areas that kind of interweave and 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 make sense together. But um, but first, yeah, the uh, trans theoretical model, which is where the stages of change come from, are, are a theory, you know, and and um, these stages. Um, whereas motivational interviewing is a communication technique, but it's so helpful. And we wrote about the stages of change in our book because it's so helpful to have those stages kind of in the back of your mind as you're working with a client. Um, to get a sense of, you know, where are they and are they ready to start kind of making a plan or are they still kind of need some time to contemplate or think through the change. So the stages um, start off with pre-contemplation. So that means uh, uh, the client is, 
either in denial about needing to make a change or just really not interested in even talking about, you know, that change. And all you can really do with a client in that situation is, um, you know, if they're interested, tell them about, you know, the, the situation and then, you know, back off and just say, yeah, but it's really up to you, whatever you decide. I just want to make sure you have the information and you just give me a call when you're ready, you know, or if you ever change your mind. Um, and then contemplation um, when, when there's a tiny window, like a little bit of interest in making the change, but, you know, a teeny piece of change talk, like, well, I guess that would help me, you know, in, but in that way or this way, okay, now we're in contemplation. It's like, they're at least kind of um, in that ambivalent state wrestling with it. There's pros and cons for changing, not changing. Um, and that's, that's, super powerful and help MI can be super powerful and helpful for folks in that contemplation stage of change, especially because it's compassion, acceptance, non-judgment, right? It's just um, what you have to be about in that situation. And then sometimes clients start kind of talking themselves into change and they may experience um, the next stage, which is the preparation stage of change, where they're like, okay, maybe if I you know, they're starting to talk it through. Maybe if I went to the grocery store on Sundays, then I would have food for the week. And so they start kind of making a plan for how it might work. Um, and then the next stage is the action stage where they're actually doing it. And if the client um, maintains that change for about six months, then they get categorized as the maintenance stage of change. Um, and so those action and maintenance stages of change are certainly the hardest of all the stages. And um, just what, just because someone's done something for six months doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that they aren't at risk for relapse, so to speak. Um, and so while we think of the stages of change as linear, they're really um, not so much. We, you know, we just kind of go all over the place, right? Um, but yeah, it's helpful to kind of have that framework in the back of your mind as you're working with clients. And I think one of the really interesting things is folks come into your office in one stage of change for one behavior and a different stage of change for a different behavior. And then what gets really confusing is a client may come in and be in the preparation stage of change for the ketogenic diet, but they're in pre-contemplation for going sort of a non-diet route. You know, they have, like, all they know is, oh, I want to try this diet that my friend's on. So there may be like gearing to go for that, but then there, so that means they're really not necessarily ready to hear a different approach. And so yeah. that gets really messy when you're working with a client. Or even like this, this example of getting a client, like this person wants, thinks that this is the only way to do certain things. And when you assess them, you actually feel like whatever they've been doing is not working for them. And they want to they feel like they should be doing the same things or similar things. And I say, look, you, we have to stop trying to at least losing weight for a little while. Just like, just, to, just tweak this change in your head and let's focus on stability of certain behaviors that we need to focus on. And maybe we can go back to weight loss uh, and dieting again when you're ready, but when you have a stronger foundation uh, in terms of your mindset, when you actually have changed certain things that are going to allow you to enjoy the journey a little bit more and make it more sustainable. It doesn't have to be such a drastic approach where, well, if I don't lose weight now within the next 12 weeks, then this program wasn't worth it. And I understand the urge for someone to lose weight, especially if they don't feel comfortable in their bodies or there's certain limitations around their, their physical, certain physical limitations. But at the same time, if there is something that is not helping them to stick to some plans, they are going to go back backwards again at some point. So sometimes it's just better to work on behavior change and sustainability and then being able to implement certain uh, strategies that are going to allow them to achieve the results and not getting back to their old behaviors. So I think this, that's very powerful. Have you found that someone who is already in action and maintenance phase, they might go backwards at some point? And how did you help them to get back on track? 
Yeah, and I think um, the key to working with clients um, who are sort of in that action and maintenance stage or even in preparation is to help them think through the uh, future and sustainability of the change before they leave your office. So um, saying things like, you know, if you look out and especially at the end of the appointment, as you look out the next three months, you know, before I see you again or whatever, um, what do you think might come up? you know, between now and our next session that could get in the way of you maintaining this change. So I think that's um, really helpful is to kind of troubleshoot ahead of time. <laughs> like, let's plan for the future. The weather might change. Then what are you going to do? You know, um, let's say uh, there's a pandemic, <laughs> you know, what, how, how would you, uh, yeah, like we, like any of us plan for that one, but um, just helping them to kind of think through, uh, what could come up at work or what could come up in their home life that could kind of get in the way. And then again, going back to the client saying, what ideas do you have for how you would overcome those challenges as they came up? Um, and, and, and then if they do come back, let's say, and they're like, yeah, so I did it for a few weeks and I stopped. Um, again, non-judgment is the most important response. So just like, oh, okay, interesting. Tell me, you know, tell me more about it. Like, why do you think that is? And what parts did you like? And what parts did you not like? And just letting them know too that this, um, that working through behavior changes is an experimental process. It's like they're doing a little experiment on their, on themselves, right? Um, and so just saying it's, it's really normal. You're just kind of dipping your toe in the water with the change. You're trying to figure out if it's a change you want to keep and uh, reassess and tweak your goal if you want, pick a different change if you want, um, it, it's all okay, right? So this is just a learning experience about figuring out what works best for you um, as far as a long-term change. And I like too that you brought up that um, weight loss being, you know, what a lot of folks want because we live in a culture that is obsessed with uh, appearances and thinness and a fat phobic culture. So of course that is what so many of our clients want. And um, they don't know that it's not necessary to lose weight in order to improve your lab values. They don't know that it's not necessary to lose weight to improve mobility or aerobic fitness. They don't know that it's not necessary to lose weight to improve their body image. They don't know about body image counseling and how effective that that can be. So that's, gets really tricky because they have all this misinformation. And um, we want to just validate and acknowledge their experience of what it might be like to live in a larger body and experience weight stigma, um, while at the same time letting them know that there, there are other roads that um, where behavior change can certainly happen. Uh, but the weight may not come off when they make those changes. And right. so we can also provide a space for them to sort of grieve that reality because no studies have ever found that weight loss has been sustained at the five to 10 year marker for the majority of participants, no matter what you know, eating or exercise plan they were on. So having to give the, the reality of that to clients can be really hard, especially if it's something they've been wanting for so long. But I love what you said too about, you know, a lot of times they, um, they say, well, this diet worked, you know, and you're like, worked <laughs> it worked what do you mean it worked is what you're thinking on the inside right if it worked you wouldn't be here seeing me right, right. <laughs> but they they don't think about the fact that it didn't work they just think about the fact that it did for those six weeks they were on it or whatever just because they saw they went they lost weight they feel right. like it worked but right. it didn't change anything here in your right. mind or any behavior and so they regained weight so. correct <laughs> It's always interesting people's definition of, of that phrase worked. Yes. So moving to MI, the spirit of MI, I think this is a, a very interesting way to phrase that, ref, that, that this phrase actually refers to the practitioner attempting to create a, this collaboratory uh, partnership you mentioned. Uh, why is this important and how it is incorporated into the conversation with a client? Yeah, the spirit of MI is everything. It's just kind of like the underlying current of the relationship between you and the client. And it's made up of four components, partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evocation. So I'll just talk for a second about each of those. But partnership is really about saying things like, 
uh, you know, I'm right here with you. Uh, I want what's best for you, but you know, you're really the one that knows what's best for you. So I just support you in whatever direction you want to take. So just kind of that idea of coming alongside the client and treating them as the expert of their own journeys and their own bodies. Acceptance is, is really, um, there are a lot of pieces of acceptance, but it includes um, autonomy support. So uh, the concept of, you know, we could go in this direction, we could go in this direction, we could go in this direction, but what do you want to do? Um, or if you're not ready to make a change right now, that's totally fine. Um, you know, here's my card and I'm here whenever, if you ever change your mind. So just really emphasizing the idea that um, there's no pressure in the situation. Um, when we think about acceptance, we also think of the phrase absolute worth, that the person is a worthy human being, regardless of whether they decide to make a change, don't decide to make a change. And obviously, of course, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, all those things, that that is a very worthy, valuable human being. And we want to give off that vibe that we truly believe that to our very core. And that requires a lot of uh, genuine authenticity, but also, you know, a lot of work on our own unconscious biases and things like that. And we want to also be affirming in that acceptance. So just giving off that spirit of, um, of noticing, you know, their positive character traits and pointing them out when we see them. And then compassion means that you're there for the client. You're not there for self gain. You're not there because you need to tick a certain number of boxes within your business. You know, you're really there for the betterment of, of supporting your, your client at the end of the day. And then the last term evocation is really the interviewing in the phrase motivational interviewing. It gets at the heart of it, which is it's you're, you're asking questions that really elicits or invites the client's change talk that invites them to speak their personal reasons for change. So the spirit of MI is evoking. It's, it's, it's really finding out what matters to them more than anything else. That's awesome. Do you, do you have um, um, in your book, and I think you've mentioned this before in quite a, quite a few of your talks that I've heard before, you talk about micro skills mm -hmm. within, e, within motivational interviewing. And what makes, makes this uh, a successful process? What are these micro skills? Yeah, the micro skills refers to the different things that you actually say to the client. And so what you say to the client are open-ended questions. Again, in that spirit of evocation, you know, what, what do you care about? What are your values? You know, what are you hoping to get out of this session? Uh, why do you want to make that change? How do you think you'll make that change? So those open-ended questions um, invite the client to just elaborate and explore and expand. The next micro skill is the affirmations. So again, noticing that they have certain characteristics or qualities that have gotten them this far in life. And um, when you hear evidence of those to just speak them to say, wow, you, you're someone who really cares about your health or you, know, you have a lot of people in your life who really love you. And I can tell that, um, that you must be a good friend, you know, to have all those people in your life. Um, so just noticing kind of as they tell their stories about their lives and hardship and overcoming hardship, you know, to acknowledge, gosh, you're so resilient or wow, you really persevered through something that was really hard so that they can hear that they have what it takes to be successful in change. And then reflections, um, or the next micro skill, and that just refers to kind of paraphrasing or speaking back. Uh, what you hear when the client speaks. And this is actually the micro skill that's the most important, most used micro skill, even more than questions. Um, reflective listening is everything because it shows that you care. It shows that you're trying to understand what it's like. Um, it demonstrates empathy. Um, and most importantly, it, you use reflective listening within MI to speak back change talk. So that the client hears, wow, I do have some good reasons uh, to want to make this change. And then summaries. Summaries are the last micro skill. And we, we kind of drop little summary bombs throughout the session um, now and then just to kind of take a step back and say, okay, let me see if I hear you correctly. You know, this is kind of why you're here and this is what you're wanting out of the session. Um, and so you might kind of 
leave a few of those summaries throughout the session to show that you're listening and trying to kind of make sense of all the pieces. So those are the micro skills. We call them the ORs, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. And most of what you say within a session as the practitioner falls into one of those categories. Mm, that's amazing. In this case, when like I, I'm aware that you write, you wrote a book for health professionals um, and fitness and nutrition. And I think this is a was was a really great resource, and I think it's still being a, an amazing resource. What sort of tips do you have for health coaches or like personal trainers, dietitians that are trying to work on their skills to have create better relationships, make their clients uh, change in their behaviors, or push them to a point where their their coaching is more effective? And is rather than being such a, uh, an, a regular and traditional relationship where you get clients that come to your office or you work at the gym with a client or even online because now everything is online and they wanting to have support, coaching, change, but you don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. What sort of little tips you could give us in that case? Yeah, I think that um, it's really interesting. Um, I can speak from personal experience in my own MI journey, but also watching again, students that I've trained and um, MI is one of those things that you, you can easily say, yes, I know MI, I read this article once, or I attended this session, or I listened to this one show with, with Astrid. I know MI, I can do MI. Um, and we often have this overinflated sense of confidence about it. And I certainly had that. I'm like, oh, I know MI. I don't need all those formal trainings. I can do it. Um, only to discover that I absolutely needed <laughs> those formal in-person or you know online trainings where you're actually getting coached on your skills. Um, and so I'm glad you asked that question because reading about it is so helpful and watching videos, you know, demonstrate where people are demonstrating the skills is so helpful but it's really not until you're in a training atmosphere where you're getting individual coaching from an MI trainer that the skills actually you know, start to happen within your sessions and become consistent. Um, and so I never want someone to think that because they read my book, like that's all it takes. <laughs> but it's really not until you're like in a training actually practicing the skills um, with the supervision of an MI coach that that it really starts to happen within your sessions and become consistent and um, you can get to that MI proficiency level. And so I just want folks to hear it's a journey and it takes time and unfortunately resources and energy um, to do the self-study part, but then to also kind of do that more formal training part. But um, it's so worth it because in the end, you're just so much more effective with your clients and you see, you know, improved outcomes and all of those things, not to mention the return rate <laughs> improves. Like those clients come back to you because they know that they can um, be in a space that's filled with not non-judgment and compassion. So it's, it's worth the time. It's worth the effort. It's worth the resources um, to, to pursue any sort of training that you can. You mentioned that there are, it is a skill, definitely is something that is a process. What, what do you find that are the hardest skills to actually implement and master when it comes to MI? Yeah, there's, there are really um, so many pieces and it's like, it's not that hard of a, of the concepts, it's not rocket science, right? The concepts aren't that hard um, to grasp as you've probably heard in, in watching this video so far. Um, but, but there's two sort of hangups that I especially see, you know, in supervising others that are really hard to break free from. And the first one I wanted to mention is the fixing reflex in, uh, Miller and Rolnick's work and, and in one, uh, you know, the nutrition of MI and nutrition and fitness book, we refer to this as the writing reflex. That's R I G H T, uh, writing reflex. Um, in my trainings more recently, I've been kind of calling it the fixing reflex, but we all have that desire to share what we know, to, sh you know, give the ideas or give advice. Um, and so part of becoming good at MI is learning how to, to quiet your fixing reflex 
um, you know, those thoughts are gonna come into your head of like, oh, I have the best recipe for this person or I have the greatest like meal planning strategy that I wanna give this person. And, and to just sort of let it flow through your body, like, okay, okay, there might be a time, there might be a place to share that. Um, and then deciding on the timing, deciding if the client needs it, the client, you may have the best idea ever, but the client may not need your idea because they came up with their own solution already in the session. So just being really um, selective about what pieces of information or advice that you share. And whenever you do share the information, asking for their ideas first, asking for permission before you give it giving the idea and then following up with like, what do you think about that idea? And feel free to throw it out the window if you don't think it'll work for you. So they just have to hear like, I have an idea, it may work, it may not work, but you know yourself best, you know? And so being really selective and careful about giving information. So um, taming that fixing reflex takes a lot of practice. Um, and then the second, thing that I find um, takes a lot of practice is good reflective listening. Just remembering to use reflective listening. In, within an MI session, you wanna reflect something that the client said almost every time they speak to show that you're listening and trying to understand their experience. And that takes a lot of practice. We tend to be questioners. Like we want, we're good at asking questions we're not very good at remembering to use consistent reflective listening. And that just takes a lot of time and practice. That's amazing. I think uh, we go to a really good place to wrap this in interview, uh, but is there anything, I know that you're currently working on a new uh, book, is an an ebook. Uh, tell me a little bit about that one. Yeah, I would love to. And I just got it in the mail today. So I'm so excited to be able to show it off. Um, so Laura Curtis and I wrote motivational interviewing and nutrition and fitness back in 2016. And, um, it's been so fun and exciting to hear how, um, well that book's doing and folks, uh, find it to be really helpful. Um, and then more recently, I just, um, this is hot off the press. It literally came in the mail today. It's called five minute MI. Okay. And it's specifically designed for practitioners who don't have a lot of time with their clients. Okay. Um, so often like in a hospital setting or in um, working with uh, diabetes prevention and pre-diabetes, sometimes you have like a little health coach, you know, phone call or a, um, a text chat and that's about all you get. So that book is more designed for folks who um, want to use MI, but they don't have long sessions with their clients. Oh, that's amazing. I'm going to link those things in your in, in the description so people can check it out and get to purchase it if, if they are willing to learn more about it. I really want to acknowledge your time and appreciate that you came over to hang out with me. So thank you so much, Dawn, and for this amazing uh, and very valuable interview. So again, Thanks thank again you so for much. Having me. It's been a lot of fun. Well, I, will, I hope to, to keep in touch with you and I'll see you soon.